Okay, we have to wait though, because that's okay. making too much noise. I'm thinking maybe I'll shut this this light off. See well, it's your production. Whatever you say goes. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, we're doing this thing where um, the Library of Congress is starting this Veterans History Project. Mm -hmm and they're interviewing um, all veterans. And it's all going to be uh, available at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. But for the 10th Mountain Division veterans, we're going to follow the oral history. We're going to follow the format of the Veterans History Project, um, but we're going to keep the tapes at the Denver Public mm -hmm. Library, which is fine with the Library of Congress, yeah. which it's also a good thing because that's so huge, yeah. it would be harder for people to, to get their tapes. Now, have you ever gotten copies of your other tapes? Uh, I got the first interview, and I think that was in Watertown. Oh. I don't think I got the one from St. Louis uh -huh. that you did. Uh -huh. You did the one in St. Louis, right? No, I did the one in Valley Forge. Okay, all right. I didn't get that one. Well, it's gotten where we've gotten so many now, you have to yeah. ask for it, and then you pay for the tape, and they yeah. make a copy for yeah. you or, or something. Well, Debbie, like Debbie mailed me a copy of, of one. I think this is the one from, from may have been it, St. Louis. Yeah, they, were, yeah. they did oral histories in St. Louis. I think this is one. Uh, Barbara did, did uh -huh. it there, mostly. Uh -huh. Debbie, but Debbie mailed the, the tape to me. That's the only one I've got. Uh -huh. I don't know. I wish we could scrap all these and use just one. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, we could probably do that. We could maybe make this be uh, the most comprehensive one. Yeah. And then I'll make a note. Because at my age, I may uh, not remember it exactly the same. I won't try to fabricate it or lie about it or anything like that. But it, uh, it might not yeah. come out the same. So. Mm -hmm. After all, the first one was done ten years ago, I guess. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, that's fine because, you know, it's kind of like pieces of a puzzle yeah. and they all come together. Yeah. One of the things that we wanted to do was ask each person the same seven questions um, just so that we have um, a basis of comparison yeah. from and people's... Some continuity to yeah, yeah, some different people's experiences. So we're trying to get a little bit more professional about yeah. professional about it, and uh, um, so you know I'm going to kind of remind you a couple of stories you told yesterday mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't tell okay. in those other tapes. Okay. It could be because when you come here, you have different memories probably yeah. than um, you would. Well, have. you don't think you forget, but uh, if I went back and looked at the first tape I made. There, there's things that I said then that I may not remember today because it's. It, well, sure, things, it, you know, you at remember. At this age, you start to lose a, uh, uh -huh. some of the stuff, you know. Uh -huh. it's, it's, and you remember some things and yeah. forget forget other things. Yeah. It's interesting, Neil, he remembered when um, Jap Japan surrendered much yeah. more clearly than he remembered when the Germans surrendered. Remind me, I, to, I'll tell you about when uh, Roosevelt died. Okay. I was in Italy in the hospital. It was two o'clock in the morning in Italy. And the nurse came around and whispered, and "President uh, Roosevelt just died." But she told two or three people within minutes. The whole hospital knew about it. Huh. Mm. But uh, and then we, uh, I was in the hospital when Germany surrendered too. Mm. Did you? Um, well, Roosevelt was really kind of a real, a real father figure for a lot of oh, people, uh, huh? Yeah, yeah the, uh, he had done so much to pull the country out of its doldrums, you know, I mean, boy, I, I can remember the, the hard times during the Depression, and they call it the Hoover days, but uh, regardless of who was in it, it was, it was just a Depression, that's all. And Roosevelt, with some of his programs, which m many conservatives criticized severely, 
even to this day, I occasionally listen to Rush Limbaugh, you know, you're familiar with him. Yeah. Not? And he criticizes, to this day, Roosevelt's decision on Social Security and on... He likes to criticize everybody. He criticizes everything except Rush Limbaugh. I mean, <laughs> and the yeah. Republican. Yeah. I've often said that uh, it, it amazes me that no Democrat can do anything right and no Republican can do anything wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet this country has been ruled by both equally. I went back and checked it all the way back. And I think there was maybe one difference. Is that right? The Democrats. So almost, almost identical. Same. Sometimes you wonder if we make any progress because it seems like the Democrats undo everything the Republicans do and then the Republicans move in and they undo yeah. everything yeah. that the Democrats have done. Well, I'm concerned now about the, where we're going with the national debt. National debt has been a bugaboo to me. We are, there's so much we could do if we were spending that interest money for projects or for, for the good of the country. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And we just keep going and going. They're, they're trillions in, in debt now. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean about undoing what the yeah. Democrats. The other Republicans yeah. took over with a, a nice big surplus, and now it's all gone, and the deficit's gone wild. Yeah. And you can blame it on the war if you want, but I heard the figure the other day of what the war has cost. It has nothing. It's just a drop in the bucket to what their, our national debt has increased, huh. and that's that's not that's bad business. That well, is bad business, isn't it? Of course, I don't dare say anything like that around Neil, because he's a strong Republican, <laughs> <laughs> and you may have noticed already I'm a Democrat. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Hugh Evans last night. We have we're having a discussion, and I said something tells me you're a Republican, Hugh. He said, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think there's a pretty equal representation in the Tenth Mountain Division of Democrats and Republicans, or? I would say it's probably so, because you had a, you had a, a, a lot of Southerners. Oh. And yeah. uh, they were more Democratic than the North. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, New England states and all were strong Republican, mm -hmm. and your Western states. Uh, Well, California's been Democrat oh, for a long California, time. California, yeah. I'm not talking about yeah. extreme West. I'm talking about yeah. Colorado and, mm -hmm. and uh, Montana and places like that, mm -hmm. states like that. But you know, the thing that concerns me is uh, with, with some of your, and unfortunately the, some of the religious oh, people have gotten caught up in this and they're promoting it. And, to me, it's separation, and that's not good. Uh, we can live together and disagree, mm -hmm. but don't have to be disagreeable, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I have no, man, I married into one of the strongest Republican families in the world. But my wife and I never, ever killed each other's vote. Mm -hmm. We decided who we were going to vote for, whether it was a Republican or Democrat, mm -hmm. and that's the way we voted. Mm -hmm. and we got along fine. I've had some almost family dividing arguments with with some of her brothers mm -hmm. uh, to the point to where I told them, I said, look, I, I, this absolutely infuriates me and I'm not going to put up with it. Either I don't come to see you or you stop talking, stop about, talking about it. Don't bring yeah. it up. So they have, they have stopped. I, even though the most of the brothers and sisters now are gone, they, there's 12 of them. There's only oh. four left. Three. Three left. Only three left. Oh. You know, that's sort of an interesting thing that I've noticed um, re recently with the very conservative right people, like the people who listen to Rush Limbaugh or um, who's that other guy? He's also really very. Frost. Um, Bill Riley and yeah. um, Michael Savage, I guess. He's yeah. somebody in. Um, that's in California. It seems like they always they can't seem to leave it alone. No, no you know, never. Uh, it's they want to make you realize that you're wrong and they're right. Yeah. And you know, 
with folks like that, it's best not to talk about politics, but they just can't seem to leave it alone. Uh, I, have well, a good, I have a good friend who's like that, and I say, you know, I don't want to talk to you about politics. We don't agree. Let's just agree to disagree, and there's yeah. a lot of other things, yeah. reasons why we like each other. Sure. She can't. She just can't yeah. let it go. It's interesting. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm not a Bill Clinton fan, but I think he did a fabulous job as president. His moral character was, you know, out the window. Mm -hmm. But uh, they can't leave that alone either. I mean, uh, he's been our president. And it's uh, six years past. Let's forget about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he did leave our company, our country, in very good shape. Absolutely. Financially. Absolutely. And, uh, but yeah. uh, and they and they're constantly running Hillary down. Yeah, I don't understand that either. She's I don't a very either. She, bright, bright she was no part of it, you know. But boy, Rush Limbaugh just, oh man, he, he says some real nasty, hateful yeah. things about her, you know. Well, it's always very easy to be critical of everybody, sure. but it's real hard to come up with your own solutions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the other thing I notice on those shows. They criticize everybody, and it's so negative, but they don't come up with any solutions no. to any of the problems either. So that's the hard part. That's know? right. That's right. If I take a drink of water occasionally during this, will it hurt you? Oh, no. no. Go right ahead. My mouth dry. Go right out. ahead. Yeah, mine does too. And then this dry air out here, you got to drink as much as yeah. you can. Well, I wanted to get a shot in my shoulder before I came out here, and I didn't get a chance to. You should have asked Neil. <laughs> 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 that was comical, I'm telling you. It wasn't funny at the time, but <laughs> since I've thought about it, how, was, how funny it was. And he said, I've shot many horses. <laughs> he yeah. told me that he hadn't shot very many and you were probably his first patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, he shot a lot after you. A yeah. lot after you. I said, well, then you practiced on Haas. He said, yeah. <laughs> Does yeah. this thing normally take this long? <laughs> it's, it must be broken. It is broken. It, it does all it's this. It's just making all these great noises and nothing's happening. It's like a little circus act over here, and it's not doing anything. Doing all these noises and doing all this stuff, and it's. Did you pour the water? Of course I did. Oh, I just checked. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. So do you do any skiing still? No. No? No. I gave it up. How long ago did you give it up? Well, I, I never skied after I got out of service. Uh, I had a bad leg. Well, that's right. And then you weren't too fond of it anyway. No. You weren't too fond no, of it. No, I, I was never an a ardent ski fan. I mean, uh -huh. I just, uh, Didn't you say in your oral history in uh, Valley Forge that you arrived there in your summer khakis? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in middle April, we already turned our ODs in in Texas. Got there with no coat, just a, just shirt and pants, you know. <laughs> Pouring the snow, and they put us on the back of a GI truck. <laughs> oh boy! I'm telling you. Welcome and to Colorado. Huh? To make it even worse, we they took us to a barracks that was had been empty for maybe it never had anybody live in it. I don't know, but it was had no, no it was completely vacated for quite some time, there's no heat, 
no water, no nothing. And we had to do all that. We knew nothing about uh, building coal fires, you know what I mean? We were used to gas. <laughs> yeah. So we had to build fires and furnace, get the water turned on, and uh, get the water heater going so we could take a shower. Where'd they get all the coal? Did they bring it up on the train? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. they, uh, mm. we had coal bins and they'd, uh, you know, they'd just keep filling them up. So that probably didn't help with that air quality oh, there no. in Camp Pale between the trains burning that the That was one of the big tr problems. All those furnaces, a furnace for every one of the barracks and every one of the mess halls and every building. And uh, it was amazing. We we take early morning hikes up up on the mountain. You get up uh, maybe 500 feet above the camp and look down, and you can hardly see the camp. It's just a, like a haze hung around right that camp. And if we were up there for two or three days, we'd begin to breathe again. It was, you, know, oh, you know, the air clean out your clean. lungs. Clean south. Wow. <laughs> then we go back and cough again. We had to, they called it the Pando Hack. Wow. Yeah, they, Did uh, everybody have it pretty Everybody, much? everybody. It was uh, just that coal smut. They sat and smoke. And they'd, they'd hook on four, or sometimes if it was a long train, it'd be six engines on it. Six of these big, huge 18 wheelers. Mm. Uh, I mean, had big driver wheels on them. And they'd get it on that mountain and start spinning. And then they'd have to throw sand on it and it'd mm. get moving. Yeah, and that's quite a grade coming it down is. from uh, Tennessee Pass, coming down there. I noticed that yesterday. Yeah, from Red Cliff, or from Minturn, actually. From Minturn on up to, to uh, Tennessee Pass, I would say they, they probably gained thousand to twelve hundred feet, maybe more. Mm. So it's uh, it was quite a climb for a, a long freight train. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't know if that still runs. I hear trains here at night, but does that particular track is that still an active track over there? They they still run freight mm. from Denver to to. Uh, Grand Junction or somewhere out, maybe on the west coast, I don't know. Oh. But they, I know they run a freight train through there because over to uh, it's Royal Gorge, they, every so often the freight train will go through there. Mm. I took the train one time, I used to live, I lived in Aspen when I was in my 20s, uh, being a ski bum, and one time I went down to visit a friend in uh, uh, Denver and I took the train from Glenwood Springs to Denver. It was such a pretty train. Beautiful. One. It was really pretty. Um, well, I'll tell you about that. My experience there in a tape. Okay. Uh, I got a, um, someone from the captain's office came over to the mess hall and told me I had a telephone call. And when I went over to answer it, it was Iva. My wife uh -huh. calling from Denver says, I said, where are you? She says, I'm in Denver. What do I do now? <laughs> Come all the way from, from Maryland to Denver and oh, I had no gosh. idea what to do. So I said, well, uh, let me, wait just a minute, let me see the captain, see what I can get for some time off. So he gave me a Did three. you know she was coming? No, oh, I had no idea. Oh, she was going to surprise you? It was a complete shocker. Captain, I said to the captain, I said, that's my wife on the phone. He said, I knew that. And I said, she's, uh, I said, well, uh, what what kind of time can I get? He said, well, I'll give you a three-day pass. And he said, I'd advise you to tell her to come to Glenwood Springs, and you'll meet her there. So that's where we met. And I rode the train down. She went left then for Glenwood Springs, and uh, that was like in the morning, and I caught the evening train. Springs. How did they house all these um, dependents? It must have been, Glenwood Springs must have been just jamming full of people. Well, it was in Leadville. Was, uh, we, got a, we had an apartment here, though, at the, uh, oh boy, which hotel was it? It was uh, just a little bitty. Mm. Only had a few rooms. But uh, there was an old maid school teacher, and her brother ran the 
Blue Hotel. And after the war, we stayed and kept in touch with her. And uh, she wrote us many letters, mm. kept us informed of what's going on. And one day we got a letter, she said, I'm, I'm in tears. I said, they're tearing down Camp Hale. Oh. I said, it's such a shame. They're good building, beautiful uh -huh. buildings. And they're just wrecking them, you know. Uh -huh. they, they salvaged some of the good stuff, but they still wrecked uh -huh. a lot of it. But uh, we stayed in touch with her until Finally, she moved over to uh, Manitou Springs, or near Colorado uh -huh. Springs. And uh, we were there on vacation, Ive and I were, and we called her up and wanted to go see her, and she said, no, I oh. don't want to see anybody, and I don't want anybody to see me. Oh. She said, I am not in good health, and I said, you wouldn't recognize me from what oh. I looked like when you saw me. This was, uh, this was probably 20 years after the war was over. Oh. So, oh. so I never did see her. Oh. That's too bad. But we used to, I and I used to take take care of the front desk for them on, on Saturday morning so they'd go shopping and get out for a while. Huh. Huh. Sometimes that's hard for people when they get older and they yeah. don't feel very well. You have an awfully nice grandson, you know that, don't you? That took way too long, though. Well, I'm sure the coffee's really good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'll shut the door behind you so we don't have those voices in the background. <coughs> you want anything, Neil? You want more water? I'm going to shut this door. Is Neil, is, is Neil going to stay around and have lunch with me? Oh, will I ask him? Yeah. Neil? I'm going to start, I'm going to just say who I am and uh, where we are and the date. I got that wrong this morning already, but now I know the date. And then um, I'll introduce you. And then you could start with um, your name and your birth date and uh, the unit. You know, you know, you got that part. And then I'll ask you, you some questions. you want me to say anything about my service before the 10th? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you should... Go ahead. We talked about that, I think, yeah. in Valley Forge, but you could go over that again, just okay. your military history and where you were when you decided to get into the Army and mm -hmm. whether you got drafted. Yeah. And... All right. Let's see how you are. You're fine. We're... Oh, no, we're, we're recorded. Uh -huh. How did that happen? <laughs> Can you back that up and erase it or what? I don't know how to do that. Let's just go. I'm Myrna Hampton, and uh, we are here in Leadville, Colorado, at a Descendants Board meeting. And uh, it is July 19th, 2003. And I'm talking here with Hassel uh, Vass, and uh, he's going to begin his oral history right now. Yes, I am Hassel Vass. I I'm 81 years old. I was born on the 10th of July, 1922. <clears throat> I uh, spent my youth on a farm, and then when... Where were you born, Hassan? I was born in uh, Carroll County, Virginia, in a rural area called Fancy Gap, Virginia. And uh, I... Married Ivor Rakes in 
June the 7th, 1941. And we lived in the Virginia area for a short time, then moved to Maryland, to Baltimore, Maryland. I went to work in the Glen Ole Martin defense plant, helping build airplanes. And from there I was drafted into the Army. I went to Fort Meade in Maryland, was inducted there. And from there I went to Fort Bliss, Texas for basic training. And after finishing basic training, I had a problem with uh, the dust. It affected it infected my throat, and I had a couple of bouts with a real infected throat. So it was the advice of the first sergeant that I should, should get out of that dusty climate. So he says, I have two cadres going out, one to Seattle, Washington, and one to Camp Hale, Colorado. He says, which one do you want? And I chose Camp Hale, Colorado because it was closer to the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was not necessarily interested in skiing or winter weather or anything like that. I just thought it'd be a little closer home. But it, it turned out to be a very, very good move for me because I really enjoyed the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, I, as I said, I took basic training in Fort Bliss, Texas, and Left there in mid-April, had already turned in my OD uniform and was in suntans. And when I got into Camp Hale, or into Pando... OD stands for? Olive Drafts. Olive Drafts, yes. okay. And uh, that was a wool uniform. And so when I got into Pando, it was pouring down snow. And they put us on the back of the GI trucks and brought us into Camp Hale. And I thought that I had made a humongous mistake, <laughs> but it certainly didn't look very encouraging. Uh, You're but, probably freezing to death. Absolutely. And uh, no jackets, no coats, or anything. And so when we got to the barracks, I thought, well, we'll get in the warm barracks anyway, it'll help. But when we got in the barracks, no one had lived in these barracks for months, if ever. And uh, there was heated by coal, and there was no coal fire. We had to build the fires, and uh, most of us knew very little about building a coal fire and a coal furnace, but anyway. Was somebody there to teach you? No, we had to learn the hard way, just, uh, just by trial and error. But we got the barracks heated up, and after, um, well, a few, a couple of weeks, then the, the weather cleared up and we got some nice weather. I really enjoyed the summer here of 43. It was great. And, uh, we had uh, 12 NCOs and a couple of officers. We were the beginning of these 727 anti-aircraft because we'd come out of an anti-aircraft unit. Now did you meet um, Neil down there? Because he was at Fort Bliss, I think, learning. No, he was at Fort uh, Camp Davis, Davis, North Carolina. Oh, okay. That's where he came That's from. where he learned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't meet Neil until uh, he came into into the unit in Camp Hale, and I don't remember what exactly what date. So we got several different groups to form the outfit. We got uh, a large group from the Mojave Desert. Uh, from an anti-aircraft uh, unit there. And we got some from various other places, smaller groups. Then uh, we, we trained as anti-aircraft for uh, quite some time. We even went back to Fort Bliss, Texas to out to the uh, desert and to do some firing with the, our 50 caliber machine guns and so forth. But eventually, uh, then when we went to uh, Camp Swift, Texas, we became anti-tank because uh, Germany was losing their, their air superiority and so they, we were evidently being trained for Europe. So. We were anti-tank until we were 
almost ready to go overseas, and we, for all intents and purposes, we became a way heavy weapons outfit with mortars and 50 caliber machine guns, BARs, and, and our uh, sidearms and so forth. When but, you, when, to, before we get to Europe, when you were at Camp Hale, what would you say was your most, um, the best memory you have there of that time? Well, I guess some of the best memories was, of course, having my wife there and having a Class A pass, I could get in to see her. But we enjoyed uh, Colorado. The summer she was here, we enjoyed Colorado so much mm -hmm. and really wanted to move back to Colorado after the war was over. We didn't, because of the weather and the scenery? Yeah, the and weather, the scenery, and the... The altitude, and the, or the uh, the the uh, uh, dry climate, and and so forth, it was just very good for Iva, especially. She had a bronchial problem, and it cleared it up in that high altitude. Mm. What was your worst memory <laughs> at Camp Pale? Well, I guess the D series. Would have to would have to be the worst. That was five weeks of pure hell. It was, uh, for the most part, everything about it was, uh, was drudgery. The, the snow was deep. The the weather was terribly cold, and uh, we moved constantly and uh, you just couldn't settle down to to enjoy any part of it. It was the way I looked at it. He just did, uh, that's not to say that we didn't enjoy some of it, but most, for the most part, that's my worst memory, the five-week maneuver. Now, you were saying yesterday that you, you got really strong, though, during that time, and you used to sometimes, uh, you could walk a long ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I had a 29-inch waistline and weighed 175 pounds. And I could hike with, you know, without any problem. Uh, even the altitude didn't didn't affect me that much after getting used to it. Uh -huh. You mentioned yesterday you used to walk sometimes to Leadville. You yeah. Didn't get a ride. Yeah. We'd start out hitchhiking and walking, but many times in those days there wasn't many cars and on the road, so many times we'd have to walk and the. It would. Uh, we'd just keep walking until we got a ride, or if we didn't get a ride, we walk all the way in. Um, you celebrated your 21st birthday in, uh, how old were you when you joined the Army? Uh, I was 20. 20? Yeah. And you celebrated your 21st birthday at Camp Hale. Yeah. They had some special event for you? Yes, the, the general, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which, which one it was. Uh, we had several others, uh, ser other than uh, our uh, General Hayes. And General Ruffner. But anyway, they had us up the field, or the, uh, field, guess house? It's a field house, yeah. And I wanted everybody that turned 21 since they came in the Army to gather there, and they had a ceremony for us. It was, it was rather nice. What did they do? Well, just made some patriotic speeches and thanked us for volunteering. <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, it was a, it was a nice affair. But, yeah. okay. So you went, you were down at um, Camp Swift, Fort Swift, and then you were finishing up the training. And then what happened? Well, of course, we all got a furlough before we went overseas. We got a fifteen day furlough, and I got a furlough from Austin. Stood up on the train most of the way for three days and nights. I remember one time I got to sit down and a lady with a baby said, I have to take my baby and for a change. Would you hold my seat for me? Mm -hmm. And I gladly did and she was gone a couple hours. She purposely <laughs> stayed gone so I could have the seat, I guess. That was but, nice, huh? Yeah. There was a lot of good memories like that, you know. In traveling, you, mm. you run into some real stinkers, but you run into a lot of other people that are sympathetic to the service man. And uh, 
Now, was Iva, did she travel, did she go with you down to? She had gone home already uh, at this to time. Back to Maryland? She, yes, she'd gone back uh -huh. to Maryland already. Actually, she'd gone back to her parents in Virginia. So. Did you get to see her before you shipped out? Yeah. Yeah, with this 30 or 15 day furlough. I so you stood on the train for three days to get back to East Coast to yeah. see her before you yeah. shipped out? Six, six days of that furlough was spent on the train. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. I left home in a blinding snowstorm. And my brother brought, took me to the to this train station down in Virginia. That's where Iva was, so I, that's where I went on furlough. And uh, I left him and my wife both crying, so <laughs> it, took, it made a kind of a sad trip for me oh, too. Oh, <laughs> I bet so. Knowing where I was going, you know. Yeah. When but, did you leave? When did you, do you well, remember the date? This was in uh, mid-December. Uh, we spent Christmas Day on the train going ahead for the Port of Embarkation. I yeah. helped cook Christmas, Christmas dinner on the train. So oh. uh, I had one of the troops some time ago tell me that that was one of the best memories he had is eating a turkey dinner on the oh. troop train and figuring that's probably the last good turkey dinner he'd get. <laughs> so Was he right? Yeah, he was right. They, we didn't serve many turkey dinners in Italy, believe me. <laughs> oh. It was uh, K rations, C rations, whatever mm. over there. What was it like on the ship? Rough. Rough. What ship were you on? Do you recall? I do not recall the one I went over on. Uh -huh. I recall very well the one I came back <laughs> on. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Tell you about that later. Uh, but we, uh, Colonel Cordes, who was our battalion commander, said, I've done you a favor. He said, I volunteered you for, for uh, mess duty. And, uh, well, we thought that was terrible, but it did turn out to be the best because we went in at 6 o'clock, worked until 6 o'clock, needed 12 hours. On the ship? On the ship. Well, you had already cooked in camp. Yes, yeah, That's what you yes. did there. Okay. And uh, uh, we got three meals a day. The troops only got two. They got one at 6 o'clock in the morning. If they ate at 6, they ate at 6 in the evening. If they ate at 8 in the morning, they ate at 8 in the evening or whatever, you know. It, it was 12, every 12 hours you got a meal. And uh, we got three and we got to eat what the sailors had and that was sometimes steak. The sailors uh, ate better than the... Oh, the sailors ate, they, they, had, they had a regular ration. What's the deal? How come? <laughs> they were, that was their duty, I mean, oh. you know, they were, they were on duty. We were just uh, freeloaders, you know. Mm. You were the freight. <laughs> yeah, right, so we were freight. You got oh. it right. And, uh, but we landed in Naples in January, and it was very cold and damp there. And I, I, this, uh, some sad experiences there. The, the poverty was so bad in Naples. And I remember the little kids fighting to, to get the, the garbage can so they could get any scrap of food that we might throw away. Mm -hmm. And we were forbidden to give them any portion of our food because they said it would just create havoc. So we did uh, sneak some candy bars to them if we could. But uh, one day we went up on uh, Mount Vesuvius, which is the volcano, and uh, on the way back we s took a 10 minute break on a, at a stone wall. Sitting on this stone wall, a little boy came up to me, he must have been five, six, and his hands were so frozen. Mm -hmm. So I s just stuck his hands in, in my gloves with my hands, and he just laid his head over I almost went to sleep hmm. in that 10 minutes and then I had to tell him I'm sorry but you know it was, it was just a, a sad situation it really was that hurt worse than anything I saw almost hmm. because hmm. The little kids had no, had no fault in it and no way to do anything about it and so it was, they were just victims you know but anyway hmm. uh, from there we went, we spent a, 
one or two nights in Rome, then on up to Pisa and spent a couple of nights there. And there we did something that I could never understand. We threw away our suntan uniforms and our gas masks and everything, and we threw them out in the field in a, just a huge, humongous pile of uniforms and it rained and everything. And they, I, I guess they just laid there and molded and ruined. They wouldn't let the Italians have them because they said it created havoc. Mm. So anyway. So they were all raggedy without any much oh, clothes too, huh? Very, very little clothes. Mm. clothes. If they were one up, we stopped a couple of days or three or four days in a villa uh, before we got to the front lines. And there I had a, we had uh, gone several days without a shower and I thought uh, this Polish fellow from Chicago and I decided we could build a shower. And we had a 55 gallon drum and some other, uh, this villa had a, a bathroom that didn't work. So we took the shower head out of that, put in this drum, and put it up on a tripod and run pipe to it. Suddenly we need pipe. And somebody told us there was a, an army depot <clears throat> a few miles up the road that had pipe. So we took a, a weapons carrier and went up to get the pipe. And <clears throat> they were not uh, too friendly about giving us any pipe. So while I entertained them, the Polish fellow found some way to get a couple she said, pipe on the GI truck, and we took off with it. And they didn't chase us, but anyway, on the way back, there's two girls hitchhiking, heading for Rome. And we picked them up. And of course, there's only uh, two seats, a driver and a passenger. And so, one of the girls rode on the, on the, in the seat. One rode on the, the uh, just a toolbox, like on the side. And the other road on the other side. And we came around the curve, and here it was General Hayes and General Ruffner in a command car, stuck up to their gazoo in mud. <laughs> Couldn't move, they were just buried. Well, we were so close to them before we knew who it was or what was going on. And anyway, we stopped and saluted and <laughs> bowed uh -oh. and did, <laughs> did everything else. But big. <laughs> and General Ruffner really started chewing us out. I'm telling you, he was, he was threatening us with court martial and everything. And he said, you know you can't haul civilians on a, on a military vehicle. So after a certain length of time, General Hayes said, General Ruffner, could I say something? And of course, one star yields to two stars. <laughs> General Hayes said, now fellas, it is a risky business, and I don't strongly recommend that, but said, be careful, don't get those girls hurt. By the way, can you guys help us out of this mud hole? <laughs> so I, I waded in and hooked a winch on them, we winched them out. And the last mm -hmm. thing General Hayes said, now you be careful, don't get those girls hurt. <laughs> oh, but anyway, there's just an innocent ride of five or six miles, which they appreciated the yeah. They had their suitcase and they were heading for Rome. <laughs> but it, well, anyway. <laughs> How'd the shower turn out? Oh, we got that thing going. And you could run a hundred men through there and never turn it off. Uh -huh. Once we got it adjusted, it was an, a lifesaver, I'll tell you. By the way, the captain said, we will leave that for the Italians, because they had no shower facilities at all. Uh -huh. We'll leave it for the towns. In fact, it was, a, it was in a tent out behind the villa, and he just left everything there. And the heater was a gas heater. That you you adjust it under this tank till it got the right temperature, and then you just let it run. It mm. stayed the right temperature. It must have felt wonderful, oh, huh? It was ideal, I tell you. Mm. Excellent. Now, in the villa, where did you guys sleep? Well, we different rooms, and there's a huge barn, which was a, a good But did thing. you have to sleep on the floor? There was no furniture in the villa. Oh, no, oh. no, we slept on a marble floor. Oh, boy. Well, the most comfortable thing in the world. Uh, we had the, the uh, uh, blankets, and I'm not sure, but we may have had some sleeping bags. I, I, I guess probably we did at that time. But Now, the 
You slept in the barn. The guys in the barn got the hay. The slept in the barn, and that was a that was a godsend because they they slept in the, in, on hay, and it was mm -hmm. comfortable. They didn't have heat, but neither did we. Yeah. The villa wasn't heated. In fact, out in front of the villa was a large uh, pool with huge goldfish in it, and they were frozen solid in the ice. We built a fire and thawed it out because we thought the fish would, were, would be dead. They weren't. They, and they just thawed out. They started swimming. <laughs> oh, but then from there we we went on up to the front lines. What town was built the villa in? Do you remember? No. Uh, I, a lot I, of you guys stayed in Montecatini for a while, I guess. Yeah. This was not in a village, really. Uh -huh. It was out in the. If I remember correctly, it was, it was out in the country, almost by itself. It was up, set up quite a ways. You had a winding road up to it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the steps to the front lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from there, I guess it's around the 21st of February, we went on the front lines. If I'm right, that I think the 21st was... Well, the salt of Riva Ridge was on the 18th of February. Yeah. And well, then, we were there a couple of days after the uh -huh. original, initial uh, assault. Mm -hmm. And the first morning was a pretty tough morning because I saw two of the fellows get uh, completely wiped out, killed. And that was your first um, time to be in That was my warfare. first experience with with war. Mm -hmm. And one young fellow, I, I had no idea who he was. He was not He was a 10th Mountain Man, but he wasn't in my unit. And he was blown off of a, by a mortar shell, blown mm -hmm. off and landed in some brush. And uh, it was straight up, no way I could get to him, and no way I could get to him from the top. And he just laid there and bled to death. It was oh. a horrible sight. Like Pleading for help. Oh. And couldn't, nobody could get to him. But anyway, then my good friend Selwyn T. Alexander, uh, he was hit uh, the same morning, mm. killed, and he didn't have to go overseas because he had a bad eye, and the medics had, had uh, given him, uh, in fact they forbid him to go over, and he pleaded with Colonel Cordes to let him go because he said, my life will never be complete if I don't get to go overseas after training with the guys all these months. So Colonel let him go and then the first morning he's killed. Mm -hmm. He had a little baby, just a week old, and he left. Mm -hmm. I got to see his wife later at a reunion in Baltimore and got to tell her what happened and so forth, and she was really grateful for the closure that she got from knowing I was the last person to see him alive. Mm. Mm. But then, I guess it was around 10 days after I got up there that I transferred over to Neil McKinstry's unit which is on Mount Peace of the Capiano. So you got way put on the end. Were you there for two weeks too, where Neil was? Uh, was and uh, Pizzo de Capiano, you were? Did you no, know? I was only over there with Neil uh, about probably four days. Okay. Late. I was in, <clears throat> with, I was with uh, the rest of A Company. I guess it was, oh boy, I don't remember these Italian names, but anyway, uh, it was a, several hundred yards from where, from Pisa de Capiano. Was it the Capabuso? Yeah, Capabuso, that's uh -huh. it. Yeah, that's where we went up. And uh, then after we went over to Pisa de Capiano, and uh, that's where I was wounded on March the 2nd. Now, how were you wounded? What happened? Well, a grenade came in the foxhole, and we had an L-shaped foxhole, and one side was covered with a slab of stone, and we took turns. One 
be on an hour, another one rest, and so this is my hour to be off. And the grenade came in, and my buddy Bradford, he he fell out of the foxhole and piece hit his boot, but it didn't, didn't hurt him. Mm -hmm. But I had no way I could get out. I was in under that slab of stone. Just instinct told me to just stay there. Mm -hmm. I did, and of course the grenade was right under my leg, and I got 14 pieces of shrapnel in my mm. right leg. Mm. That was 8 o'clock in the evening, and it was 8 o'clock the next morning before I got out of the foxhole. And it took another eight hours to get me down off the mountain. And uh, I have uh, since expressed many times my uh, appreciation for the 126 engineers for building the tram because I got to ride that tram across, which saved hours of, of time of men carrying me across on the litter. So, so how did you cope with the pain up there? Uh, well, t to get me out of the foxhole is, I was so stiff and sore that it was rather painful. And a fellow named Neil McKinstry said, I might be able to help. And he had a, a tube of field morphine. And he shot me with that. And uh, he says, do you don't have anything to worry about? I said, I, I've shot many horses and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I thought to myself, yeah, I've seen a lot of Western movies where they shot the horses and had a broken leg, and I have a broken leg. <laughs> but anyway, this was a big, big help. I was thankful for that because it really took care of the pain for several hours. And then uh, got back to the first stage station at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They dressed my wounds and made it, me as comfortable as they could and I headed back for the field hospital. And on the way, they put me on top of a Jeep, on a litter and tied on top of a Jeep and two guys were driving and the Jerry started shelling the road that we were on. So they immediately parked the Jeep, got off the Jeep and hid on, in the ditch. So there wouldn't be it. Left me hanging up on the Jeep. <laughs> so anyway. Were you yelling at him? <laughs> I, I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> uh, it, it taught me how valuable I was. <laughs> uh, but I got, I got back to the field hospital. I remember it was well into the night. And... Uh, that was another experience. Uh, this was the first stages of the wounded. They were uh, operated on there, and whatever they could do for them, and then they were sent back to hospitals. And anyway, I spent, the, I think, two nights there, and they did surgery on my leg and put it in the cast and sent me to 64th General Hospital in Leghorn. Now, it's not called Leghorn now, but that's the, what it was called in Leghorn, Italy, mm -hmm. port city. And uh, I spent uh, April, March, April and May there. Left there the latter part of May on a hospital ship Thistle. You remember yeah. the name of that one, huh? Yes, I do. Uh, I remember when I got on, it was about almost lunchtime, and the nurse came around and said, what would you like for lunch? And I said, well, as long as you're asking, uh, just bring me a, a nice T-bone steak and a baked potato and a salad and a piece of apple pie. Thinking I was being a smart aleck, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's what they brought me. Whoa. Believe it or not, that's what she brought. And uh, she Have laughed, she says, uh-huh, you thought you could. <laughs> we couldn't produce that, didn't you? So anyway, that was a nice experience. That was very nice. But how was your wound? How was your wound doing at that time? <laughs> well, it was still very painful. It was swollen badly, and uh, 
I did, had gangrene and they had operated on so many times trying to remove all the, the uh, surgeon whose name was Cohen, Major Cohen. And uh, I've often, he smoked cigars and I often wanted to find him so I could send him a box of cigars for mm. his work. But anyway, uh, he found a piece of uh, wool pant in my leg, which is causing the gangrene that I had. And uh, so they wouldn't let me leave the that hospital until my temperature was normal for so many days. And every morning I'd <laughs> wake up praying my temperature would be 98.6. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I made it. I had a, a one of the nicest little colored guys next to me that had been shot, and his temperature the morning he's supposed to leave was up, and he didn't get to go. He was from Oklahoma, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to leave him and uh, cry because he he didn't get to make the ship. Yeah. But anyway, coming back on the hospital ship, our theme song was guess what? Sentimental journey. <laughs> Every morning woke us up to with that theme song, Sentimental Journey. Oh. So we got we came, and that was a, that was a nice experience. Uh, about fifteen days on the hospital mm -hmm. ship. It was very nice. The people were all nice. It was very smooth sailing. It was just very good. And uh, we landed in Columbia, South Carolina. They so we had a, we could make one telephone call. So I was working in a plant, and I said, I don't know whether I can get her there or not. But that's, they didn't have a telephone in their home, mm. and so they said, Well, give me the name of the plant. I did. And they called and got her on the phone. Oh. <laughs> called the office, and they went out in the plant and got her and brought her in. Oh. So I spoke to her and. Uh, then they, they had told me they were, I would be going to Woodrow Wilson General Hospital in Staunton, Virginia, or Stanton, and uh, told me about when I'd get up there. So she said, well, call me when you get up there, and I want to uh, come up and see you. So I did. And my mother and my wife and I came up to see me. And there's another great reunion after mm -hmm. six months or so. Mm -hmm. So, then from there I went to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia for convalescent and didn't get out until September. So all, overall I was in a hospital and, uh, and recuperation in, for six months. September 46? 45. 45. 45, yeah. <clears throat> And then what happened? Then you recouped, and did you get out of the military shortly thereafter? Yes, I did. Uh, 24th of, December of uh, September, I was discharged uh -huh. from Camp Pickett. Were yeah. there any difficult parts of transition for you from being in the military to being back in family life and uh, civilian life? It was, a, it was a real struggle. It really was. I couldn't be satisfied anywhere. I don't know why. You know, I just, and uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I couldn't do what I wanted to do because I and I had already decided that we'd stay in the military. I wanted to stay in the military. And after being wounded, of course, they, they oh. discharged me. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I finally went back to, from Virginia back to Maryland. Worked a short period of time in a defense plant. Uh, wasn't a defense plant then. It was a. They were actually uh, transition as a transition from defense to civilian. And uh, I had several jobs. Then I got into sales, and from there, that was all I wanted to do was work in sales. I worked 25 years for one oil company and retired from. 
So you just had a restlessness because you sort of had one goal and... Yeah, because I think this, the biggest thing was I couldn't do what I really wanted to yeah. do. And, uh, you know, you get the feeling it's unfair, mm -hmm. you know, which is not right. It wasn't a matter of fair and unfair, it's just I, that's the way I felt. Mm -hmm. But uh, things worked out. Mm -hmm. How come you never came back to Colorado? I mean, you're here today, but... <laughs> we, we wanted to come to Colorado and fully intended to, but we couldn't get enough money to get out of town. So <laughs> <laughs> by the time we did, we had made so many friends in Maryland, we didn't want to leave, really. Yeah. So that's, but we loved Colorado, both of us. Mm -hmm. We came back several times. For uh, vacations? For vacation, right. yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say in this oral history that you haven't said? Well, I've said too much already. <laughs> no, you haven't. Uh, if anything I've said sounds like I was bragging, it's not the case at all. It's simply a uh, well, you wormed a lot of it out of me. <laughs> but uh, uh, I just, uh, I am so grateful for the young men who are fighting today. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I received a letter from uh, the general commander of the 10th Mountain Division, 10th Light, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he, he had, was, announcing a, a get-together of the vets.